is to share. This is the fourth, uh, nearly at the midway point of our third season. My name is Joe Steinfield, and I am the moderator of this series, which, as you can see, is sponsored by Beltetz and the Savings Bank of Walpole. And what Ed Watazek over here is our audiovisual expert, and I'd like to acknowledge him. And uh, as you can see, he brings all of this equipment so that we have the ability to get this program on YouTube, and it will be available forever. Uh, the turnout today uh, is a tribute to our speaker, Mary Islin, whom many of you know. She is from Brockton, Massachusetts, but has lived in Cheshire County, specifically in Marlboro, for 45 years, raised three sons here, and when we spoke a few days ago, she said, I just love it here. And the title of her talk, My Life as a Painter, A Continuing Journey, it's always difficult for speakers to decide on a title for their talk. But having known Mary for a while and spoken with her, it's really the perfect title because it is her journey, starting when she was real young and got some crayons. This is a woman who loves to paint. But it's not the only thing she does. Oh, by the way, here is a painting which everyone would immediately recognize as Mary's. And the sheep. Well, she's a farmer. I asked her, well, tell me what you have on your farm. And the answer was lots of hay, <laughs> horses, uh, beefalo. I'm not quite clear about that. <laughs> sheep, and maybe a few chickens. So uh, I just want to say that uh, every month when I get up and do this, I'm so pleased to have such a turnout and to have speakers. One of the requirements is you have to be from the neighborhood. Our speakers are all from the Monadnock region, and they all are volunteers. It's my great pleasure to introduce, where, ah, there you are, Mary Islin. Hi. And I have to see if I'm talking, am I talking into the microphone sufficiently? Well, the first thing I want to say is thank you all for coming. One of the first things I thought is, oh, we thought postponed, nobody's going to be here. You know? So thank you for making the effort to come out, all of you. Um, and this, I'm, this it seems to me a great um, improvement over the old butter knife in the slide projector. So hopefully I'll be able to work it <laughs> and put a beautiful PowerPoint presentation together for me. And okay, where to begin? I wanted to say, you know, I tried to put this together into some sort of a linear form. However, it's about my life. And my life has had so many different things. It's a little more like taking a bag of marbles and dumping it from up high. And yes, you could track the trajectory of the marbles as they're falling down, but then they would go all over the place. So it won't be as linear as it could be. Can you still hear OK? OK, good. All right, so to begin, I will try to work this thing. <laughs> No, not that one. Point it that way. Point it where? To the uh, projector, I think. No, you shouldn't have to point it. You no? Just, just push the button. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay, here is the inspiration of my life. It's my husband, George. <laughs> and I get from the reaction that very many of you knew him. 
And he was, as I always said to him, even when I was throwing things at him, you're perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and he, he was, it was like, he passed away two and a half years ago. And I still feel, I still talk to him more than I talk to anybody else <laughs> in my life. He's still there supporting me. He's still there supporting the farm. I really hope <laughs> and believe. Um, he was just great. He, but it was a lot like being married to the cat in the hat. You know, he could hop on the ball with the fish and the rake and the cake and the book, but that was not all. <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome being married to him. It was wonderful. I mean, it was such a gift. I still feel like I'm the luckiest person I ever met. So, um, okay, don't point it there. Point it, yeah. When you're married to joie de vivre like that, I mean, that's got to be something great in life. <laughs> and I'm just going to... He, we did a lot of different things. He was a farrier and hay farmer. He was so supportive of me and my art. It was unbelievable how supportive he was. But there were little things like this. One of his sidelines was that he bred Morgan horses. And this was his last baby. And she followed him up on the porch one night. And, you know, horses can get up, but it's a little harder going down. And she was so little that instead of making her jump off the porch, he brought her through the kitchen and living room and out the other steps. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a pretty great life if you're exposed to that kind of thing. Oh, wait. Backwards. Backwards. I thought there were more. Okay, maybe not. Okay, so getting on to me. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the clock. I do have a tendency to ramble on. So anybody that wants to interrupt with questions, or comments, please do, okay? But I'm going to try to get to the end here. I was, it was almost that stereotypical story of, you know, I was a, less than a year old and my mother put a crayon in my hand and I drew a picture of a horse. A tremendous number of women artists seem to do that. Actually, it was a picture of Nana with a ponytail, but the second thing was a horse. <laughs> um, my, George used to say a tremendous number of his shoeing clients, he was a farmer and a farrier, he shoed horses. Uh, he said a tremendous number of his clients, like disproportionate number, used to, they either had left a full-time career in horses to become a professional artist or left a, full, a professional art career to become professional horse people. So there's really a connection there. I'm not sure what it's about, but it's definitely there. And when I was little, my grandfather recognized how much I liked horses. All my grandparents were Lithuanian immigrants. Well, one was born in Southie, but barely, you know. And because the, her whole family was from Lithuania. And he, his job in the village over there had been to herd the horses. That's what he did. And he, had, he was full of stories about, you know, the wolves and sledges and herding the horses and swimming the horses and all of this really wonderful stuff. And he got me riding lessons, and he took me to them every week. And I wanted a horse. I wanted a horse. I saved up my money. I had enough money for a horse. My father would never let me have a horse because he said it'll interfere with school. And he was right. I mean, he was really right. But he was really supportive, and he rented me a, the, a nice old horse every summer. And I, the first time he rented her, he traded an old, great big old Chevy sedan for three months that I could ride this horse any time I wanted that she wasn't being used by the school. So I, was, I spent an awful lot of time with horses. And as Joe said, I was born in Brockton, Mass, which, you know, it has a terrible reputation, but the part I was born in was the Lithuanian village. And I guess it was a really tough section, but I never had any idea of that until someone told me in my senior year of high school. It, it was a great place to grow up. I could look out all the windows and see, from three sides of the house, you'd see livestock of some kind. Either, you know, the people would have a couple of cows or some chickens, or everybody had a garden. It was a huge percentage of immigrants. Um, it was a great place to grow up. We had a swamp across the street. And um, I went to a Catholic school, which was a great experience. I had a great life. <laughs> Um, it was a great experience for me. It wasn't anything bad about it. And then I, w I wound up going to Brockton High School. And at that time, Brockton needed a new high school. They really needed five new high schools because both geographically and the number of students, they needed five. But they really wanted a good football team, so they built one. 
<laughs> and if you wanted to slide through the cracks and never be seen again ever, it was so easy. On the other hand, if you were interested in something, those teachers would bend over backwards for you. And I think I got a better art education at Brockton High than most people got at college. Um, there was a big fine arts building, a whole wing. And, you know, they had five, four or five fine arts studios. They had music rooms, soundproof music rooms with grand pianos. They had, an, back then, you know, video was brand, brand, brand new. They had a video place upstairs. They had big theater, little theater. They had all of the arts. It was fantastic. And the teachers, you know, also the height of the drug culture. Those teachers saved so many lives because, especially my main teacher that I always thank, Robert Higgins, he was the head of the department and he did everything for the kids. Like we were in the studio a minimum of four hours a day, often back there after school, often back there at night. He took us to New York, he took us to Boston. He had figure drawing, life drawing, the whole nine yards. And He'd make new classes. If you ran out of classes, he'd just make another one on the, the spot, and the guidance counselor is there, but, 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 and he said, no, I just made another one. She's coming. And they'd make rules. You had to go to a certain number of study halls a week. He'd march in, he'd grab you, and he'd say, she's coming with me. You can't. Well, she is. Come on. And he did that for so many kids. And if they weren't interested in art, they weren't welcome. But if they were into art, he, he was fabulous. He was just great, really great. And so I really, he was a great mentor. And I was all set to go to um, UMass after college. And at the very last minute, I switched to creative writing. So I wound up going to Simmons for a year. And in retrospect, I've had so many students who have said to me, you were so lucky. Because if you wanted to, at that time, if you didn't want to do abstraction, UMass was the worst place you could land. They said they, they crushed everything. They'd say, it took me 40 years to have the, the courage to pick up a paintbrush again. So I was really lucky that some angel walked in and just... <laughs> and I went to Simmons for a year, which was wonderful being in Boston, but it was expensive, so I went, I switched over to McGill in Montreal. And that was another awesome experience because it's a really good school. You know, it's cosmopolitan. There are people from all over the world, and they assume that you're going to do the assigned work, and then they support you in taking off on your own interests. You want to illustrate that paper? Wonderful. You want to pass to study in the graduate Jungian library? Fantastic. <laughs> you know, they were just great, so I really loved that, too, and I painted a lot while I was in college, but the, my very last year, I knew, I, I suddenly realized I wasn't going to have a license to do anything when I got out. I hadn't taken any electives. I went to my advisor. I said, I want to take all my electives right now in education. And he said, what, are you nuts? He said, you're going to hate that. You, you've got to sign up for grad school. I said, no, I'm going to do it. I need a license to do something. And he tried to talk me out of it. And I said, but I can do it legally, right? He said, yeah, we'll make you a special program. You can do it. So I did it, and as I'm walking out, he said, I did the exact same thing, see you in two years. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I was teaching at Hampshire Country School in Ringe. It's a school for emotionally disturbed but gifted children, the one Temple Grandin went to. It was fabulous. And while I was there, I mean, I didn't really have any responsibilities, you know, except my job. And I, I was teaching the the young kids and also the riding program, and I thought, I'll buy a horse, you know? Then there'll be more horses for the kids. And somebody introduced me to George, and that was that. <laughs> I had also um, sort of half enrolled for Berkeley grad school, and that was that for the grad school, too. I just, I was with George, that was it. And, okay, so, that, that's at Brockton High, just me sketching. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And, oh, and so this is my life with George. We had three <laughs> wonderful boys. We really did the whole back to the land thing. Those poor kids didn't get a lot of time to, to gather moss in the house. Um, we'd take pictures of them if they ever fell asleep taking a nap like a normal kid because it, it would suddenly get quiet and they'd wake up. <laughs> um, they were outside an awful lot. Oh, that was 
no, that's the wrong one. Okay. Hey. His little knit pants, his little knit sulkers. George had a lot of pigs. Um, you know, Simon Montgomery's book, The Good, Good Pig, he came from our house. George had like 20 brood sows for a while, and that produces at least 200 piglets. But they were the old-fashioned kind, and they were so nice. <laughs> so anyway, they were real nice piglets. We had goats. Well, our oldest son was allergic to cow's milk. George had jerseys when I met him. Ge Ge Geordie couldn't eat, drink cow's milk, so we had goats. Um, did a CSA. The Waldorf community asked us if we'd pr you know, be part of a CSA program, which I really wanted to do because George loved working draft horses and I wanted him to have the chance to do so. And we did it for five years. It was wonderful. But he continued to hay, of course, a lot. And he also continued to shoe horses. So it was pretty hard to squeeze all of this in. But that's one of our kids harrowing. Um, and George with his pigs. We, he used to take them out to the big summer quarters out in a big field, and that must have been them coming home for the winter, some of them. And oh, George and I always said to each other, we can't possibly get divorced, because nowhere else in the world will we find someone who hates Frisbee, cannot stand playing cards, and will not tolerate watching organized sports. So we got to stay together. <laughs> Hence, our children rode horses. <laughs> And they all had their ponies, and we rode all over the place. I would put, um, I, you start out with a kid in the backpack, and, the, and then the, you have another one, so you put one on the pony and lead it, and then you put one in the backpack, one in the front pack, one leading, the, the, you know. So anyway, it moved on from there. <laughs> we, we used to have to take the top tiers off sometimes to get under the bridges. That was back when everything was thrown up there by hand. <laughs> and I had, when they got big enough that I didn't have to lead, I got a horse. And, you know, I had a number of horses. And George, that was George's spring ritual he did for me, even at, long after we stopped the CSA. Every spring, he would get my gardens ready for planting. And, and you know, he'd plow and harrow with the horses. And it was like almost a sacrament that he'd do that. It was so fantastic. And, you know, we really did do the back to the land thing. He got an old um, combine and grew grain. I re I'll remember when we tried to dry it on the, the barn roof and it would rain and we'd all race out there and try to get it off the roof in time, things like that. We, we really did, we put up all of our food and grew all of our food and the kids grew up on veggie goop. And <laughs> There wasn't a lot of extra energy at the end of the day. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of time for painting and writing. I remember at one point I decided, of course I can do this. Other women paint with their kids. And I looked up and it was two and a half hours later and none of the kids were in the house. So they were really this big. And I had no idea where they were. They had gone, they had left, and they were just on the loose somewhere. Another time I thought, well, I can plan air paint. You know, they'll play around me. And they really, they wanted to climb up on the car and slide down the windshield. And I heard this big whomp. And Jacob's diaper had made a big hole in the windshield. <laughs> you know, it was that safety glass, so he didn't get hurt. But So I, I thought, you know, I better, I'm not going to try for a while. Okay. So then, the kids got big enough, so all they wanted was for me to have food in the fridge and let that leave them alone. <laughs> and George and my dad got talking and decided I needed a studio. My father and, was very, and mother, they were incredibly supportive too. They were saints. Um, so um, they, George built me this beautiful studio. We've got an old early, early 1800s farmhouse, and the attic was just the one-inch boards with all the frost coming through them. You know, it looked like upside-down ground up there in the winter. And he, George loved stuff. He got rid of all his stuff, and he built me a gorgeous studio. And of course, I'm saying, okay, Catholic background and everything, not to mention human condition. I'm saying, oh, I don't deserve to paint. No, I don't deserve a studio. It's awful. I can't do this. And he said, I don't care if you never paint in there. It's yours. And the kids aren't allowed to take it over. That's it. 
and I, he built a trap door. He said, sit on it. They can't get up here. <laughs> And so the first thing I did was, you know, I'd written these little stories for them growing up. So I just did watercolors. Watercolor is not my medium. They weren't very good, but they got me going again. And this is when I started slowly getting back into oil. And I was painting what was around me. And as I did that, I realized I need a refresher class. You know, I haven't painted seriously in 15 years. And so I asked around, and I wound up at Sharon Art Center which, it was such a gem, it was such a jewel. I walked in there and Deb Chichico, the director at the time, gave me a pamphlet. She said, we have a new teacher here and here's some of his stuff. He's got an exhibit going on and here's the pamphlet from it. It's down in Boston, you can go see it. And I look at the pamphlet and there are two artists, it's a, an exhibit of two, and I thought, well, this guy is really, really good so he's probably dead. And then there's this <laughs> other one, they, that's probably the teacher. Well, he was the really, really, really good one. And he happened to be one of the best teachers I've ever met in my life. He had studied at the Art Student League with David LaFalle. And he also, in his plein air work, had a real impressionist bent, which is a place I can mention that, like, my whole life I loved impressionism. And I loved tonalism. And I loved some of the best illustrators. Those were like my three go-to things. And I used to sit for hours in front of Renoir's dancer, literally hours just staring at it, at the MFA, that sort of thing. And, and where was that going? So I had those three real interests. And Alex was great. You know, he had the, the, he had studied a lot in Italy too. And he had that academic background and the very classical painting, but also really believed in plein air painting. And I remember, when, like I had plein air painted in high school a lot and in college a lot, but I remember the day, I don't remember if it was high school or college, but the day that it really hit me why people bothered to plein air paint. I was at my grandmother's house, she lived next door, and I was painting, I think it was a cherry tree, and with all the grasses, you know, the kind of gold grasses around it, and it was fun and blah, 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 but then it got to be late, late afternoon and that light came slanting in and all of a sudden, there were all of these violet shades and peach shades and magical shades of all kind. And they were changing like boom, 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 so fast. And I'm thinking, this is impossible, but this is it. This is what it, people paint about, you know, the kind of painters I liked. <laughs> and it was so incredible. And it was shortly after that that I stopped painting real seriously. But I remember that painting so, so, so well. There's a quote where Monet came running in one day all excited and said, I finally have it, I have it. Light is violet. And you, so often I'll be out there and it's, you're, it's the end of the day and you're tired and you've been painting for hours and you say, oh my gosh, it's working. Oh God, thank you, it's so beautiful, it's really coming. And then you realize it's shadows on the edges of the paint. You know, it's not what you painted at all. <laughs> but it's that kind of thing that you want to catch, that golden light and violet light, or I do. And in different atmospheres, it's very different. So, oh, there was George again. Always loved painting flowers, growing flowers, looking at flowers. When I was a kid in the cow pasture that the old ladies had across the road, as they got older and older, there was less and less maintenance. The flowers went wilder and wilder. It was fantastic. I would pick them. I'd go out there and paint them. In the CSA, people used to say, well, you have really good food, but you know, let's face it, you can get food anywhere. We come for the flowers. <laughs> um, I loved, I always have loved flowers. Oh, that's a little out of sequence. That's my Belgian nudes. That's my figure painting. <laughs> This, there are two paintings, only two paintings that George ever asked if we could keep, and that was one of them. Him pull, he used to hook the kids' sleds together and go pulling them around with the horses. That's just taken with a different camera. So neither one is quite right, but I put it in anyway. This is the second painting he ever asked to keep. This is moving into a time when I, I had been painting George and painting George and painting George, and he said, would you paint somebody else? He said, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> so I started going to all of these different horse events, because horses were very big in our lives. And um, 
this was a team, this was at Stonewall Farm. They had a sap collecting contest every year. And this was a team that was good friends of ours, and they bred Norwegian fjords, and the one in the center is a stallion. And we get there in the morning, it's real early, and Dick says, I want to do, I want to do a three horse, horse hitch, but I never done one. <laughs> Will you drive him first? <laughs> so George drove him around. You know, the public wasn't there yet. He drove him around quite a lot. And he, it was so much fun. He said they were so, like, wild and free that he wanted to keep the painting. So uh, he, we did. We kept that one. That's sap collecting. I, I started working in a series more and more. And this is a real seminal painting for when the, the series idea gelled in my head. And what I mean by a series is a, a, a series of paintings which is exploring one idea or one motif. Because what happens is when you start a painting, plein air is different, this is more studio paintings. You start a painting, you have a, this great idea and you're all excited about it. And then you have another idea that you're all excited about, the same <laughs> Same motif, like the same bunch of apples, so to speak. But you're all excited about that one, too. And you want to do both of them. And then there's a third idea. And in the beginning, most painters try to jam all that into, onto one canvas. And it doesn't work. It's just a complete disaster and a waste of time and material. So I started working, um, you know, like I think I did a whole a number of paintings of this sugar house over at Stonewall. And what was exciting to me about it was I wanted to explore different atmospheres. So in this one, I must have used my own mixed black, sort of a violet, bluey, that color, and then put the, the sunlight colors on top of the steam. But then I remember I wanted to see what it would look like in a snowstorm. So I did one like that, and then it was, you know, I changed the foreground some, but it was very, it was the same sugar house. And then I wanted to see what would happen if instead of using my own mixed black base, I used purple and green instead of the, the red, brown, and blue that I usually mix for black. And so, you know, it, it started developing, this idea of um, painting in a series. And, what, and the other thing that happens is if you, can, if you only have one shot at getting it right, it's absolutely, it absolutely paralyzes you. That's when the laundry gets done, the floor gets washed, you go buy food and keen, you visit a relative in another state, you know, <laughs> because it's so scary to start on this idea, because what if you wreck it? But if you're working in a series and you wreck the first one, you have a whole bunch of more options. You know, you can try again, keep on trying until you do succeed. So I really like working in a series. And I might as well mention this now, too. See that painting on top there? the one that's in gold. Most, not all, I shouldn't even say most, but many oil painters paint in one base color. They do their underpainting in one color. And I think it's very much dispositional what suits you the best. I was taught to use ultramarine to begin with. That didn't work for me at all. I was always working against the cold, cold colors. Um, a lot of painters, especially plein air painters, use burnt sienna, which is kind of orange. And I can get a painting to look great that way, but it doesn't usually feel like me. And th this color really works for me. So I often, well, while I'm on that really excited thing, and I, you know, my house is more of a mess now because I don't have to avoid wrecking the painting as, as thoroughly, because <laughs> I have all these chances. But I block in a number of paintings with that motif in this for studio paintings. Out, and outside, this underpainting color works really well because I use it to mix greens anyway. You know, if I use, say, red or something, it's going to just make mud outside. And see on, okay, there's a, a thing here. what colors do you use to get that? The, ultra, the raw sienna? Oh, oh. It's just raw sienna out of a tube. Oh. Yeah. And see that goldy part there? That is, in some places I applied it over, but in a lot of places it's the underpainting showing through. Not all, but many. Okay, come on. More stonewall sap collecting. 
George at the sap collecting. George never paid attention to rules. You know, he just, he, like, he just didn't read them. And then afterwards he'd say, well, I wonder what went wrong. And they'd say, well, because you went off course or something because, and he, he didn't pay attention because he was so non-competitive. And then he started, they have a team at Stonewall. You know, see those two guys on the back of the sled? And they were young and they were like, what do you mean we didn't win? And so he read the rules and he won every year after that. <laughs> he was a very good teamster. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on. This is, um, I used to go up to Woodstock, GMHA, Green Horse Mountain Association, and do, get, meet people who drove sleighs a lot. And in the meantime, I did a lot of outdoor shows. I never did as many as some artists. I had one friend who did over 50 a year. You know, I did maybe 12 a year at the most. And now I no longer have a van to put all my stuff in, and I hate driving on highways. I don't drive on big highways. So I, I only do local ones now. But they can be very good, and they can be a lot of fun. Another series, I wanted to, ex this is um, horses in our pa front pasture at sunrise, in the mist. And I wanted to explore those different colors of sky and how to get them. So I did a whole bunch. And I returned to these themes a lot of times over my life. This one has gold leaf on the edges which I painted over, and there's, there are more later on, but this is just part of that series. Oh, and now we'll go into tonalism. As I said, I've always loved tonalism. When you think of tonalism, think like George Innes, um, Child Hassam, Boston Common, that version of Child Hassam, because he was a tonalist and be later became an, an impressionist. But it's dark. My definition, which I learned actually from someone else, <laughs> is that in a good tonalist painting, you can really only kind of identify two colors, and the rest is sort of primal mud. It's darker, it's very glowy. It, they're beautiful, and I love them, and I've always loved them. And I had an opportunity to work with Dennis Sheehan, who's a really well-known tonalist painting in New England, and nationally, but he's based right around here. And he is an amazing teacher, and he pulled some fabulous paintings out of me. This isn't them. <laughs> but, but um, you know, while I was doing them, I could see they were coming out really well, but they were so not me, I wanted to jump on the canvas and stomp it to death and, and break all the stretcher bars, because it made me so mad to be working with all this dark. And it was just a a thing that happens, I, you, you have to work out of your own soul, you know, and maybe I'm glad, I'm so glad I got to work with Dennis because someday maybe I will want to do that. I still every now and then go back and try one. But so far I haven't been able to go away from the color. I love color. I have, oh, I forgot my show and tells. Um, while the kids were little, one of the things I did a lot of was sheep. And this, this isn't the most garish of them. But I, I spun their wool, and I dyed their wool, and I knit their wool, and I did all that kind of thing because I needed the color. I needed it so badly. Um, and this is my version of a tonalist painting, not very tonal. I mean, it's got color all over the place. And, and this is one of my favorite ever paintings. I really love that painting. And this is a series. <laughs> and this is, <laughs> this is a good, pl I, I just got into these sometimes. I'll go back and forth a little. Different seasons. Every now and then I return to these. Come on, little, sp oh, whoops. <laughs> Anyways, this is a good place to segue into Sharon, back to Sharon Art Center. So I was showing in, you know, a number of galleries, including Sharon Art Center, which was our real going concern at the time. I mean, you'd go to a plain old call to artist show and you'd find paintings from artists in Japan. You know, it was, it was a good art gallery. And um, I remember when Deb asked me, she said, if you ever want to teach, you know, that'd be great. And I said, I'm not ready yet. I'm still working on my own stuff. And then I started getting so excited about color and about the series thing that I said, Deb, I'll, can I teach a class? And the, f the main class I taught there, I taught it for about 10 years, was out of the rut, kick in the butt. 
<laughs> which was, it was geared to people who really wanted to get going and they just couldn't get over themselves to do it. it whether that was get back to it after 50 years, whether that was I want to copy a whole bunch of ex expressionist paintings, I want to try tonalism, I want whatever, but they had to commit to seven paintings in this series. And it turned out to be such a great class. I know Anne Sawyer was in it quite frequently. And I mean, a lot of these artists, I, I'd look out and I'd say, you're taking my class, I should be taking your class. But it, there was so much energy generated in it, it was so much fun. And there, was the, there were these great paintings that came out of it from everybody. And I remember, you know, we just had a show at the Civic Center that was just taken down very recently. And it, um, it was, I think it was in our first class that we did that. It must have been a snow day or something, because there were only a few of us sitting around. And Alicia Dracciotis said, you know, we all paint farmyards. We ought to have a show. <laughs> and I remember Anne and I both looked at her and said, good idea. You thought of it. You do it. She comes back next week and says, I booked the Civic Center. <laughs> and so that was really kind of wonderful. It began us on this, what I consider this, I consider it a pretty important show, because it's all, we've done it six times, we just had our sixth triennial. We try to do it every three years. And it's all based on agriculture, preferably local. A lot of times conserved farmland, but a way of life. I mean, the Monadnock area is not all about can we compete with Nashua. It's all about, to me, there's a mountain, there's land you can hike on, there's agriculture. You know, this is something we need to value and protect. And this show has really given a good group of artists a really good way to make their statement about that. And like this year, we got support from the Monadnock Conservancy. They were underwriting us. And, you know, so that was nice. And that came out of that class. And we had a lot of other shows, too, student shows and things like that. Um, come on. Okay, and then this happened. <laughs> my grandkids, the one that's closest to me here isn't actually a grandchild. But my, you know, we had a, another, a lot of you know, the last couple of years have been pretty rotten in my life in some ways. We lost a grandchild and we lost George. And um, my son Toby had always wanted to build a house in the or orchard. He was the, the dad of Henry, who we lost. And when, you know how they, built, they dig those ditches around the foundation for drainage? Well, <laughs> they will always remember it. They're really great parents, and so is the neighbor kids. Um, the, his parents are great, too, because they enjoyed that ditch tremendously. <laughs> but these guys, you know, I, and I said at the time, I'd been teaching, I loved teaching, but I couldn't do more than one day a week, and I wanted to know who my grandkids were. So I said, well, something has to go. I can't keep up my own painting schedule, still have anything to do with the farm, and take care of my grandkids. And so I stopped teaching. I, I, that was the one that I let go. So I had the kids a day a week, usually. And that's Alady, with her chickens. Come on. Alady. <laughs> He was so good. That was Henry. He was so good with the animals. They loved him. And that's George and George. George and George. Come on. It's not moving. And oh, good. Oh. George, or my grandson, George, had to sign up for the pig scramble. He was as young as you could be. He was barely old enough to enter. And my, uh, my, all my kids said, Mom, are you out of your mind? Do you know how many years it took you to talk Dad into getting rid of all those pigs? I sign him up for the pig scramble. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't last long. Um, the pig was way too young to have been put, put in a pig scramble. And she, you know, she had wound up having little issues. They weren't bad issues. But he sold her. He managed to sell her to another kid that won a pig in the pig scramble after a couple weeks and some vet bills. <laughs> um, and, and she was go, supposed to go get eaten, but instead they fell in love with her, and she's now a brood sow. <laughs> that was Ahsoka. But they had an awful good time with her. It was nice. They used to give her bots. George kept on with his horses. That's George in his heaven. And George also got beefalo. So, you know, 
we're making all this hay. By this point, we were up to about 10,000 square bales a year and another, a lot of round bales as well. We've been blessed with our neighbor, who from the time he was this tall, Matt Patnode, has hayed with us because he can't stay away from farms. And he loves the equipment aspect. George loved the horses, but Matt loved the equipment. And so bit by bit, Matt got more and more involved in the equipment. And George said, you know, I sell horse hay. And we met, some of the hay is inevitably not going to be that great, so we should get beef cows. The trouble being that neither George nor I like to eat cows. Um, but anyway, we did. And a beefalo is a cross between, it's, got, it's an established breed, it's got buffalo genetics and beef cow genetics. And they have very lean meat, but they're not quite as nuts as a buffalo, because a buffalo remains a wild animal. But they still get pretty wild, and George loved that. You know, we'd spend days chasing down the beefalo sometimes, and when he, they had to move from pasture to pasture, this is how we did it, and we'd pull the whole neighborhood in, and it would be quite something. And that's George with George. He, they're hooking onto a log there. And one of the things, since George passed away, I just don't have the oomph to keep going out with my grandkids to teach them to ride. So my son, Jake, said, well, why don't you put them on the draft horses? He said, you get on the old lady draft horse because you have to ride her because otherwise she'll just go home. And the other two will probably follow her. And we had an awful good time. <laughs> and George, my husband, taught... He had Jake trimming his pony by the time he was that age. And Jake, my son, is teaching his nephew, George, to do it. And he's George crazy about it. I don't get a lot of painting done these days, but I'm so glad to have them up there. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. And there is my joie de vivre guy again. It, it, when we did get time, we'd try to get up, you know, get on the, our horses and ride. There he is. He had an awful good time. Henry, my grandson, used to love to play with the iPod or the camera or anything like that. And he, he took that. I thought it was great. And I kept doing the shows, which I'm still doing. <laughs> and then the sheep. I thought they, they deserved their own little section. Um, I, I, I've always loved sheep. I, as a kid in high, high school and junior high, you know, you'd go to a county fair, and my friends would put up with me for a while, and finally they'd say, why do you want to be in this sheep barn? And I never had any idea. Absolutely no idea, but I just liked them. And the, as soon as George and I got together, he always wanted a small mixed farm. And I was interested in having some sheep, and he was so supportive of that. He said, let's get some. So we did, and the numbers have gone up and down over the years. They were a little up here, but they're very good models. <laughs> very good models. And they have this beautiful wool. And I always swore I would never do hand spinning because I thought it would be such a waste of time, but I was selling this gorgeous wool that you could practically eat. And so, of course, I learned hand spinning. And then I spun, and I spun, and I spun, and I knitted, and I dyed, and I did the whole nine yards. It was really good. I don't do it much anymore because of the time. And wool is a miracle fiber. It really keeps you warm. <laughs> These sheep had access to the barn all night. They didn't even come near it until I brought the bale of hay out. I mean, they really would prefer to be out where they can get exercise and fresh air. And you know, their wool is this long. They're not cold. And they're a great inspiration. And so I married into the Island clan, and oh, I still feel like it was sort of ma marrying into a, people who were descended from the gods. They could stay up really late and everything. <laughs> and we'd come home sometimes, you know, midnight, 2 o'clock on Christmas Eve, and that inspired all of these star paintings. And they have personality. I always say they're my still life object. You know, I remember one time, I, when I finished my first Sheep with Stars painting, I nearly started to cry because it was done. And I thought, I can't do it now. And then I realized, you know, still life painters paint more than one painting of apples. <laughs> and I love doing it. And if I had a goal in my painting, and I, I hesitate to say this because these things are very fluid and can change, but if I had a goal, it would be that my paintings help me make people happy. 
One of my other really good teachers, and I didn't work with him a lot, but he really helped me a lot, was Robert Collier, the pastel painter. And I used to look at his work. A good friend just gave me two of his paintings because I always regretted never getting one before he passed away. But um, I used to look at his work and I'd think, how many divorces has he prevented? How many cases of cancer has he prevented? Because people would come home and just go, <sighs> you know, go into that peaceful place. And anyway, so they're my still life objects. They have it all. They, they, they're fleeces. Wool sheep take sparkly light. They reflect color. They have texture. They're out in all times of the day and all seasons. They're, they're really great models. Oh, wow. I, I stopped doing bottle babies once my kids grew up. You know, I just give them away. And then I had grandkids. Bottle babies take a lot of time, too. But they're great models. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a commission. That's Ro Rudyard Kipling's house in the background over in Brattleboro. It's one. I love doing flowers, and I started marrying the flowers and the sheep. And it's a little whimsical, but I love doing it so much. I, go, I get into these long ones. I think this was five feet long and only about this wide. And they are just fun. And it was Robert Collier. He's, he, it wasn't paintings this long, but 12 by 36s. He called me up, I think, and he said, Mary, you have to paint this size. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you have to paint this size. I said, why? He said, because everybody in the whole country has a sofa, and a lot of them have a fireplace. <laughs> There's <laughs> always one in every bunch. Whoops. Well, something happened. Joe's after me to hurry up. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Okay, and sometimes I do just a normal painting, too, you know, without all... Because the mood of that is what I was after. The mood of that is what I was after. That's, this was just at the show in Jaffrey. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I have forgotten. That's our farm. Okay, and that is just, I just love doing that. Okay, so that's where we were. Now we'll go forwards again. It's my studio. And the lambs, every year, I really do wait for the new models to get born. <laughs> And that you can tell by, if you look back at the years, you can tell which ram you used that year. Because they, they look like their daddy. <laughs> and so now moving into plein air painting. I do a lot of plein air painting. At Sharon, I also taught plein air painting. I taught quite a lot of things at Sharon. But the two main things were that out of the rut class and also the plein air. And then I'd fill in for what they needed. But this is probably my all-time favorite spot. You meet people from all over the globe here. It is so beautiful. I remember one time talking to an old lady and her grandchildren, and my easel blew into the pond. And I know myself well enough to say I probably didn't say, oh, caca. <laughs> and she, her grandkids were in the car, and they were so bored. And whatever I said, and then when I weighed it in, and I'm covered in muck. And this really nice older grandmother, she's saying, oh, be careful, be careful. There are snapping turtles. There are. I've seen ducklings go under. And I'm wading around, digging out my, and the kids are like, their eyes get bigger and bigger. And they're like, art class isn't boring anymore. Look at this. Look. And their ears are perked up. I don't know what I said, but they were interested. And the, when they drove away, her husband actually had his hands like this. <laughs> So I said interesting things, but I love painting there. I love it. I try to paint there at least once a year or more. Come on. So Mary, yeah. is that Perkins Pond? That's Perkins Pond. And this is another favorite painting place. Most of you know the Uptons, whose home this is. And 
I, I try to paint there every year, too, and it's a really great story how I started. I was out painting at Perkins Pond, and they came by, this very nice couple came by and said, we have a really nice view of the mountain if you'd ever like to paint at our home. And I said, thanks very much, and I kept painting. And they came back and they said, we really have a nice view. Okay. <laughs> we really have a nice view if you'd like to paint it. And I said, oh, thank you so much, and I kept painting. The third time they came by, they said, get in the car now. <laughs> And I've been there every year. And Dory always says, well, the flowers aren't that great this year, and they're always better than last year. You know, she's just amazing. Nelson, they don't my sheep. The sheep weren't really there, but I put them in. <laughs> it's another Perkins Pond. I try to get there really early whenever I can. This is up at Fairwood by the Dublin Golf Course, mm -hmm. which is another great place to paint. It's where they have that Enjoy Rock. And I used to drive by or ride my horse by, and I'd think, I want to paint here, but I was afraid to ask. I didn't know who to ask. And then they wrote Enjoy on the rock. Oh, it's a great place. Come on. This is up, you know, if you go up Snow Hill Road, up towards where Pompilia was. Mm -hmm. And it's very private, but now and then a plein air paint out group will get permission to go up. So that's one of those. This is the same place, but it was very foggy that day. So I kept painting. I mean, I was up there, and so I kept painting. It was really fun. This is another favorite paint painting place where I go a lot. It's Monadnock Berries. And that was when there happened to be a lot of goldenrod there. This, I went. I went down to Monadnock Berries to, specifically to paint the poplar trees. And I got there, and Anthony was happily bulldozing them. <laughs> but there were a couple left. And <laughs> so I kept painting. And then he did leave some. Well, here, just give it a little kiss or something. Oh. Yeah, sorry. You killed it. I killed it. <laughs> Um, we, what we did not get to, but it's five off it's, or something, ten off. Um, what we didn't get to was my fantasy um, realm. And I figure I'm a Gemini, so it's okay if I have a whole different genre of paintings. And I only let myself do them every few years. Um, it, oh, good. That's Mananoc Berries. <laughs> Go ahead. You can keep going until you get a b bunch of ladies on riding on horses or something. Oh, no, I do, once in a while I do architecture. I put those in to show. <laughs> once in a while I do architecture. <laughs> Go ahead. Frost Free Library. There was a big, beautiful paint out at Cathedral of the Pines this year. That was one of those. This is from the Jaffrey Garden paint out, and that was so wonderful. Total magic. I, th I think Sally's here, her guard. Yeah, Sally's here. Um, it, it's an ench absolutely enchanted garden. It really is that beautiful. And paint outs are so great because the organizers get permission for the artists to go into places they would never even see, never mind have permission. And usually, you know, it's a little spooky to go into a brand new place because it takes a while to get used to the geography and the light and all of those things different things, but when you're on a paint out, you don't have permission to be there tomorrow. <laughs> so you do it, and it's really great. And then you often make friends with the landowners so you can get back. Go ahead. Have Thanks. Have you painted at, um, at Dick and Heather Bain's garden? No. No, I haven't. I'd love to. Um, you should ask, ask them if I can. <laughs> um, I was. My car needed to get inspected, so I put all my art stuff into the, the garden way and took it to the orchard, and that cat stayed with me all day. <laughs> the entire day from morning till night. A lot of canvases went by. <laughs> this is up at a Allison's Orchard, where I, one year, they had the most incredible display of poppies and bachelor buttons. They had worked with the government to put in pollinator patches, and it was just like being in France at the height of the high impressionists. It was so magnificent. I went back there every day. I'd try to drive to Hannaford's, and my car would keep going, and we'd go to Allison's, and we'd paint. <laughs> and 
And I'm so glad I did because those, those patches never came back. I mean, it's still beautiful, but those the po poppies, it was a sea of red with blue. Oh my gosh, it was gorgeous. Go ahead, Ed. This is that painting finished. Okay, and we got to the fantasy paintings. Um, I don't know where these come from. Every now and then, I have to do them. This is a real old one, but as I say, my parents, well, we're all of Lithuanian extraction. My grandfather, on the way out, had spent quite a bit of time in Russia, and I was raised on Russian fairy tales, and these sort of happen. And you never know what's going to happen when you let yourself do them, but boy, they're fun. So go ahead, Ed. You can just go ahead. This, um, Baba Yaga's horses were the inspiration. Dawn, daylight, and night. So, go ahead. <laughs> inspired by George and Henry. Henry, Henry had a blue thing. So, and it's inspired by George and Henry. <laughs> and this one I put in because my granddaughter asked me if she could have it. I was so <laughs> flattered. So, <laughs> and I love it. I, I really love it. Go ahead. Okay. Another obsession with me is prismatic color. And every now and then, I have to work on prismatic color. And you can say, OK, it's a rainbow. It's just a color wheel. It's the chakras, whatever. But that prismatic gradation of colors through the spectrum. And that's, you know, it keeps recycling. Like every five or seven years, I'll have to do another bunch of paintings working on prismatic color. So go ahead. Ed. And this, these are some with the gold around the edges. And this was a whole series. I, again, I wanted to do the prismatic color. And so I decided I'd do them through the chakra systems. So I did seven. And there was, I started with a different color background for each one. And they looked really great together. <laughs> this must have been the blue one. And that central square in Keene has the gold leaf around the edges. Central square in Keene, just a traditional oil painting. <laughs> George working, um, doing a chamber event in Peterborough. And that was so much fun because another, someone everyone here probably knows, was going to bring Morgans, a team of Morgans for Santa Claus. But she didn't show up, and she didn't show up. We'd been doing sleigh rides all afternoon. But she kept not showing up, and it got to be dark. And so they said, Santa Claus, get in this one. And Santa Claus had bad knees, I think, and he didn't want to climb way up there. <laughs> but they got Santa Claus in there. And he said, we're all set to deliver Santa Claus to the tree lighting place. And then she shows up. And I remember looking at her horses in the, the dark with the headlights. Their eyes are rolling around. <laughs> and I think, oh boy, poor Santa Claus. But Christmas was not canceled, so all must have gone well. <laughs> And this was a Jaffrey, Jaffrey Center. George used to do a private party in Jaffrey for years, every Christmas. And sometimes you hit a magazine, too. And I did a whole series of paintings based on that. It was so magical. One year, it was, this is Nelson. George grew up in Nelson. And so it meant an awful lot to him. And it's very scenic, so I used it for a lot of, you know, you add all this stuff. You get the architecture down, but then you do all of the other stuff. That's home to me. And that's George getting wood. We always heated with wood. George getting wood. George, he, we, those were ho the horses we called the whiteys. He needed a new team. And we tried American creams. Jake still has one. You, you don't have to stay on her. <laughs> or her. Or her. <laughs> George used to, um, when the Lipitsons would come to Cheshire County every year, he'd go down and trim them. I think that, that particular one made it onto a designer beer label over at Nye Hill. This, he, the minis, he used to sometimes have to go do minis, and sometimes he'd just pick them up and carry them in the house in the winter oh. and trim them there. His beefalo, his beefalo, his beefalo, his horses. That, he loved doing sleigh rides. And that's my son, Jake, who now, he doesn't do sleigh rides anymore but just because of the time elements. He shoes horses, too, and he just doesn't have time. But he loves driving them. My inspiration, the alarm clock. <laughs> Go ahead. Again, George. And I just did this one, and it had George's gesture in it so nicely that I have to keep it, I think. George's beefalo, George's beefalo. Kids on the rope swing. Boy, they love that rope swing. 
I went up to paint apple blossoms at Allison's, and this is what I got. Granite State Minis was having a field day up there, and there must have been 20 or 30 of these little carts with horses. So I didn't get the apple blossoms. <laughs> Another, this was a show, forest show at the Historical Society, and that was a friendly farm. A show, um, ASA in New York State does, it does a, sh a show every year. It's comparable to our Monadnock Conservancy, a benefit show, so I often participate in that. This is a very unusual one for me. Toby said after Henry died, one of the only things that gave him hope was driving towards the mountain at sunrise, and he asked me to do that. Henry loved dandelions, I love dandelions, and the sheep do. George picked those either in a hayfield or a cow pasture, farmer's bouquet. <laughs> and the deer ate all my sunflowers three times, but they came back again, some of them. So I had to paint them. And that's George and Henry. <laughs> With the reins. Questions, comments, criticisms, and wisecracks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worn out. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? We have some people yeah. uh, online, do we? And uh, who would like to start? Yes, please stand up so we can all hear you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mary, when is and where will your next exhibit be? I have work in galleries all the time. Mm -hmm. I have some at Hannah Grimes and Keene, which is real close. They now have a real gallery space, too. Um, I've got Three Pairs Gallery in Dorset, Vermont, is a really great gallery. Um, I'm at, at Vermont Artisans in Brattleboro. Mm. But right now, I don't have a specific show planned because this is the time of year when artists produce a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I. I mean, I'll do Art Walk and Keen, I'm sure. You know, you know, one of the things, one of the things Joe asked me when we were talking about the talk was, like, are you in museums? And that never, I, I just haven't worked towards that kind of thing. Um, I want to paint. And, I, you know, in the beginning, oh, I took a class at Sharon Arts Center about how to sell your artwork, because I didn't know. Like, I didn't even have a charge card, never mind know how to take one. And I used, it was like a six-week class. I took another one later that was a little less ex exhausting. But um, I'd come home, and I'd cry, and I'd break cups. And I was so, it was so upsetting, all of this new stuff and how to sell yourself. And you know, I, apply, I did a lot of this stuff for a while, and then I realized this is really expensive, and this is, it, when I get in these shows, I gotta spend all this money to ship the work out there, and a lot of times to ship it back, and my friends who get big awards have to get on airplanes and travel all over the country all the time, and I didn't wanna do that. I love the Manadnock area. I absolutely love it. I love painting here, and there, it's like infinite, and my son, I mean, I was married to a farmer, and your roots go all the way down to the center of the earth. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know my uh, next big show coming up. Brilliant answer. Who else? <laughs> Someone else? Uh, rare opportunity. So your entrance into college, what time period was that? 70s? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Did you go to Mass? You, Mass oh, I, had, I went to a very, yeah. yeah. Upheaval. Yes, could you stand up so we can hear you? Yeah, uh, the very first painting in the beginning of your talk was sort of magical. It was a, a dragonfly and maybe some kind of amphibian. Yes. Uh, and then I assume that's one of your first paintings because it was in the beginning of the show. But then at the end, you talk about a recent phase, which was also magical. Uh, so I was wondering if there's any connection between the first uh, the first one and the, and the second. Only as it resonates inside of me. You know, I, I guess I feel like the spiritual world, we are light, and it, it's part of us. And so, you know, those were watercolors that were meant to get me back into painting at a time when I hadn't painted for a long time. But yeah, all of that fantasy realm is very, very real to me. And it still is. It always has been. 
So it's a different medium. <coughs> I, I'm not writing kids' books now to illustrate, but um, yeah, so it is connected. It's connected within me, definitely. Someone else? Yes? We were wondering whether George made your beautiful stand. No, that is the Jeffrey Simic Center beautiful stand. <laughs> uh, would you stand up so we can hear you, please? Sure. Mary, tell me what you do when you get bored. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep. Sleep. What do you do? I don't. Uh, repeat the question. What do I do when I get bored? I, I have been fortunate enough almost never to have been bored. I, I'm just really fortunate that way. Uh, th there are so many things I could do. Um, one of the things, oh, never mind. Well, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yes, would you stand up and oh, okay. so everybody can hear you? Mary, I just wondered are the gold frames typical of plain air? They're, they're very typical. If you go to a new catalog and you want to look up that sort of painting, you, you Google plain air frames. Mm -hmm. And most of my paintings do really well in that color because of my underpainting, which is that gold color. However, some need silver and some need dark. The, you, the painting tells you what it needs. Who's, yes, would you stand up, please? You said in your busy schedule, you take time off for grandchildren, time off for the farm, and this, and time, you, in your, you schedule your painting. Do you schedule. actually schedule painting time? I can't schedule anything. <laughs> <laughs> you notice who's calling on people, and you notice who got hold of the clicker near the end. <laughs> so it's basically when you feel it. No, it's not when I feel it at all. It's I try to get there every day and just do it, whether I feel like it or not. Oh, okay. And some days you don't make it. And I have to say, one of the things I always really valued in myself was the ability to focus and to be alone. And since George passed away, a lot of that has gone. I often, well, for years, I've listened to books on tape. I can't listen to music while I paint. It's way too distracting. But I can listen to books on tape. I can listen to the same book on tape 150 times, because I don't know what it's at. But it keeps me there. Like back in the days of real tapes, it would be, well, I'll go do that at, at the end of this tape. You know, and then, of course, you, you would be really be into your painting, so you just flip the tape over. <laughs> and it would keep you going. So I do use that quite a bit. And it's, I've been interested with other artists. Many, many use music. I could do that back in high school, but I, in college, but I can't anymore. I, I really can't listen but to music. But you do. You paint every day almost. Almost, yeah. yeah. OK, ah. one more. Yes. Mary, have you ever been tempted to try to do human portraits? I'm terrible at them. I have no, yes, the time I was the most tempted was when my kids were growing up, like, you know, adolescents. Because even a person that's going to be so ugly when they're older is so beautiful then. They're just so beautiful. But I was always, I, I'm a terrible portrait painter. For humans, I can get horses quite well. <laughs> but in a way, it's a gift because I'm not distracted by that. But. Um, I was afraid that if I tried to do them, if they didn't come out well, like they'd have this bad self-concept because they were at that cusp. And yeah, when I walk into the grocery store and there's a beautiful checkout person, it's like, I often tell them, I'm a painter. I'm not a portrait painter. I wish I was when I see you. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, uh, please stay for the reception. Please come back. Uh, on February 2, Dick Ober is the head of the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, which is an important uh, charitable grant giver in the northern part of New England. Uh, Dick Ober lives not far from here. And one thing we try to do is have variety. And as you will see coming up after Mr. Ober, is folk music, uh, Susie Spickle from the Harris Center, and healthcare. So we are continuing to grow our program. Tell your friends, please come back. And now I'll introduce David Beltet, who is the 
president of the Jaffe Civic Society. Thank you, everyone, for making it here tonight. And, and uh, we're so grateful that you are here. Uh, thank you, Mary, for thank you. speaking. As a token of our appreciation, we have a small bag of gifts. And thank I'm you. glad to hear you have the heat by wood because there's plenty of components in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, everyone, please, uh, please help yourself to the refreshments in the back after. And, Thank you very much.